Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Jim Olson, Assistant Executive Director of the NTCA. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Today's webinar is titled Concrete Moisture in Tile Installations. And it will provide a thorough understanding of why moisture is needed when a slab is considered cured, where that excess moisture could be coming from, and how to prepare the slab for a successful installation. Our sponsor for this presentation is HB Fuller Construction Products Tech Division. Before we begin, I must take care of a little business. Today's webinar will be muted. Please use the participant feedback or the ch chat screen on your computer to ask questions. We will answer your questions at the end of this presentation. All of our webinars are archived and available to watch at any time after the webinars are presented. Please email your request to me. I will provide my email address on the chat screen when we begin, and I will send you the link to the archived version after the program is over. If the audio on your computer is poor, call the number on your chat screen to listen on your phone. For today's program, we have two speakers. Our first speaker is Emily Bruner. Emily is an Area Technical Specialist for HB Fuller Construction Products, covering the Southern United States. Emily works with application techniques, training, and troubleshooting for surface preparation, tile setting, and flooring adhesives. Emily previously worked in the packaging and converting business unit of HB Fuller, specializing in tissue and towel adhesives before joining the construction products team two years ago. Emily participates in demonstrations, training, and of course, the occasional canoe trip. Our second presenter is Aaron Mickelson. Aaron is an area technical specialist for HB Fuller Construction Products. Aaron works on training and troubleshooting for tile setting, flooring adhesives, and concrete repair and restoration. Aaron joined the construction products team in August of 2018. Welcome, Emily and Erin. We look forward to a great presentation. Thank you, Jim. Uh, like Jim said, we're going to be covering concrete, moisture, and tile installations. I'm Emily, and I'll hand it off to Erin. All right, thanks, Jim and Emily. Um, I guess we'll just get started right away. So we'll start with the agenda. Today we'll be going over concrete basics, effects of moisture in concrete, moisture testing of concrete, moisture solutions, and then we'll wrap it up with conclusions and we'll open up for questions at the end. And whether you're with a large company, an individual installer, or anywhere in between, hopefully this presentation will provide useful insight into moisture in concrete. <clears throat> so there's four main components of concrete. The first is cement. Uh, that's the main binding agent. It holds everything together. Next up is aggregate. This could be rock, sand, or gravel. Aggregate is inert and it's needed to make concrete. So cement and water actually do react and, and make a cement paste, but that's a really weak paste. So aggregate is needed to provide the strength and the volume needed to withstand the project requirements. Next up is additives. Additive, additives modify performance. Some additives include superplasticizers, rheology modifiers, fly ash, and many more. These additives make the concrete mix appropriate for those specific job site conditions. And then the last component of concrete is water. Water activates the cement, provides workability, and kicks off the hydration reaction, which becomes part of the matrix. So the hydration reaction I just talked about, that's cement and water reacting. This produces heat. Aggregate does not react. It's, it's in the reaction, but it, or it's in there, but it does not react. It's only the cement and the water that react. Water is consumed in the reaction, and proper portions of each component are required. And I'll get to that more in a bit. This is curing. Concrete cures. It does not dry. 28 days per inch of concrete is a rule of thumb. Over 90% of the strength is developed at this point. To get to that full 100%, it's going to depend on environmental conditions. For example, high temperature and low humidity will speed up the curing process, while low temperature and high humidity will slow down the curing process. 
So as I said, concrete cures, and when concrete cures, it shrinks. So control joints are needed to manage cracking. A typical way to do this is to cut the slab with a saw at predetermined spacings. This saw cut joint provides designated pathways for the concrete to crack. Pictured here is a, is a slab that was saw cut, and in that yellow oval, you can see that it was cracked right down the middle on that saw cut joint, which is exactly what we wanted. It doesn't go outside of that yellow circle, and, if it, and you have to honor this crack all the way through the, tile, or the flooring installation, so you have to have a plan for addressing. No matter if it's a grout line or a tile, anything over this grout joint or this saw cut joint is going to crack. So water to cement ratio, this is what determines how fast or slow it's going to cure. This water cement ratio is just the ratio of the water to weight of the water to the weight of the cement. A typical water cement ratio is about 0.5, so one part water to two parts cement. Just as an example, a water cement ratio of 0.5 is going to yield 4 to 5,000 psi concrete with a weight of 280 to 300 pounds per cubic yard. Too low of a water cement ratio is not going to allow for full hydration. As another rule of thumb, about 0.35 is the minimum required water to cement ratio, and anything over 0.35 is going to help with the workability. Some applications such as pumping requires a higher water to cement ratio than traditional methods, or a different alternative when you're pumping is to put more additives, one of the four main components of concrete, put more additives in the concrete if you want to keep the ratio consistent. Too high of a water to cement ratio can decrease strength and increase porosity. Highly porous concrete requires extra preparation because it's so thirsty that you might have to use primer when installing tile because the thirsty concrete is going to suck moisture out of, the, out of the mortar and cause problems when curing. So an analogy that we like to use is thinking of Kool-Aid. So if you mix Kool-Aid, and you don't have enough water, you're not going to dissolve all of the Kool-Aid. And when you have just enough water to get everything in solution, it's going to be too strong to drink. And this is the same if you have concrete. If you have just enough water to hydrate all the concrete, it's going to be way too tough to work with. Conversely, if you have too much water, with the Kool-Aid example, it's going to be way too dilute and it's going to taste pretty bad. With the concrete, you're going to have weak concrete that's very brittle. So this moisture of convenience, this is anything over the water to cement ratio of 0.35. This is water that's not consumed in the hydration reaction. This moisture of convenience makes concrete workable. Any excess moisture uh, must leave the concrete. Pictured here is a job site where this machine is pouring concrete over this yellow impermeable moisture vapor barrier. This vapor barrier has to meet the requirements of ASTM E1745. The only place for this moisture to leave the system is through the top. So once the flooring is installed above this, the moisture is going to be driven out through the easiest pathway out of the system, and that's going to be the grout joints. And I'm just going to talk about that in a few minutes. So external sources of moisture, this is going to be any moisture that is induced in the slab that wasn't there when mixing. This could be groundwater, precipitation, poor grading, or, or others. These are the three most common, but there are way too many to list on this slide. Picture here is a, pic is a crane that is installing concrete slab outdoors. If you can see, there's no clouds in the sky, so this is really ideal conditions. But going back to that rule of thumb of 28 days of curing per inch of concrete, it's definitely going to rain during that month, so you have to have a plan of attack and have a way of addressing that precipitation when it does come down. So we've been talking about moisture in concrete. The first one is liquid moisture, and this is a problem that causes hydrostatic pressure. So shown here is the diagram of flooring that has a water table beneath it, and then there's a water table on the side of the wall, and it's all below the ground. This hydrostatic pressure is just liquid water that exerts force on a concrete wall. This pressure can be so great that actual liquid water is going to travel through the slab and it's going to lead to flooring installation issues. This is typically an issue with below grade concrete, so in a basement. Factors such as the water table rising, which could be an increase in precipitation, grading changes, or flooding. These factors can arise before 
during, or even years after an install. So if you suspect hydrostatic pressure, you have to call a structural engineer to remediate the issue. An example in the field that we see pretty often is homeowners remodeling in the southern, southeastern United States. Here there's a water table that's right beneath the flooring, and they're ripping out carpet, about 1,100 square feet, that's been down for years. And carpet's really breathable, so this hydrostatic pressure really wasn't an issue because it just went right through the carpet. But when they ripped it out and installed tile, there was cases of extreme efflorescence, where after continuous acid washing, the problem returned. So there's really no fix to this. Again, you have to call a structural engineer to remediate this. The other source of moisture you're going to have to deal with is moisture vapor. Again, last slide was about liquid moisture. There was liquid moisture that was going to go through the slab and pool up on your flooring and cause issues. This is moisture vapor. This is moisture of convenience or any e external source of moisture that's going to leave the slab. Again, there's a permanent moisture vapor barrier needed beneath the slab, as shown here in the yellow. There are certain products that have limitations on MVER, which stands for moisture vapor emission rate, and percent RH, or percent relative humidity. And Emily's going to talk about that in a few more minutes. With fast track construction becoming more and more common, the adequate curing time, again, the rule of thumb, about 28 days per inch, that's not always going to be allowed to meet deadlines. So it's going to leave high moisture contents in the slab. Fortunately, there are moisture mitigation products that can reduce these levels to acceptable, uh, for acceptable flooring. This picture here is just a cutaway of concrete slab with that yellow impermeable vapor barrier, concrete slab, and the water vapor ha having to leave the top. Here's a picture of uh, the same job site from before. They're just finishing the concrete now. This yellow film is, again, impermeable, but if there's any cuts, rips, or tears, they're going to cause problems with that concrete curing. So you have to have a full, intact moisture or vapor barrier when installing. OK, thank you, Erin. I'll take it over from here. I'm going to go into a few of the effects of moisture and how you may know if you have a moisture problem. So the first one that we're going to touch on is the time to get onto the concrete itself. While you may not be used to seeing mortars specifically listed, or limitations specifically listed on your mortars or grouts, surface preparation products and crack isolation products, which are commonly used in tile installations, often do have limitations. So here in the bottom left, you can see a job site picture with self-leveling being installed over a moisture mitigation system. So likely, the moisture in the concrete was too high, so a moisture mitigation system was used prior to placing the self-leveler. One thing to note is that the moisture mitigation system is being used to stop the moisture from affecting the self-leveler. It is not being used to stop the moisture coming out from the self-leveler. So as you can see on the diagram on the right, the moisture mitigation system is placed directly on top of the concrete. Typically a primer is used, and then the patch or the self-leveling underlayment goes on top. And again, you can see that yellow film is the intact vapor barrier that Aaron talked about. Another common effect of moisture that I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with is efflorescence. So moisture is needed to carry those salts from within the concrete up to the surface and deposit as those white salty substance on your grout joints, which we call efflorescence. Moisture can come from a variety of sources, including the grout itself, the mortar, but most commonly, and what we're going to talk about here, is the moisture in the concrete itself. So the higher your moisture of your concrete, the higher your chance of efflorescence. So this really does come into play with tile installation. As we're seeing more and more gauge porcelain panels, and as they get bigger and bigger, I think the five foot by 10 foot are quite common now. They're quite impermeable. So with that, you need to plan for how that moisture is going to escape. And with that, with these installations, we're seeing that the grout joints are getting smaller and smaller. So this leaves very little room for the moisture to escape. So this is a higher chance of efflorescence, especially on newly poured slabs. Now, I know we typically think of mortar when installing tile, but we did want to touch on those adhesives quickly. So mastics, they don't cure. They're going to dry through evaporation. So if you have a wet slab and an impervious tile on top, the mastic may never dry. Additionally, mastics are an organic product, and they can mold and mildew with, with 
the moisture in the slab itself. And I know this is tile, but I know there's a lot of crossover or a lot of installers that both do tile and resilient floor covering, so we just briefly wanted to touch on this one. Adhesives can be greatly affected by moisture. This will present in resilient installations as bubbling, cupping, tenting, gapping, et cetera. So with this, you're having the flooring that is impervious. There's no grout joints in a sheet vinyl installation for the moisture to escape through. And all of that moisture is trapped underneath, and this can cause the desponding issues or those issues that I just listed above. Additionally, like the mastics, this can lead to mold and mildew. And where you see these sheet vinyls installed in schools and in hospitals, mold and mildew are really not desirable. So it's definitely something to keep in mind if working with any kind of adhesive, be it resilient flooring, adhesives, or mastic. So we've described the problems and what they look like, but how do you know if you have a problem? So we're going to go into a couple of test methods here. The first one that we want to talk about is ASTM F2170. This is commonly referred to as the in-situ probe test. This is a quantitative test. You're going to get a number, and in this case, it's a percent relative humidity or percent RH. And that is going to tell you the equilibrium moisture content throughout the entire slab. So with this test, what's really neat is you're getting a full picture of the slab. And how you're doing this is you're going to drill in about 40% of the thickness of the slab. So if you have a five inch slab, you're going to drill down two inches and place the sensor. If you have a slab that's drying from two sides, so multi-level construction, you only need to drill, drill in about 20%. So in that same five inch slab, you're looking at drilling down one inch. That sensor is placed and 24 hours later, once it has reached equilibrium, you can come back and take your measurements. Three tests are required for the first 1,000 square feet. You don't want to just assume that the moisture content in one area is the same throughout the entire slab. As Aaron talked about, there are many different factors that can, that can affect the moisture content in the slab. Some benefits of this test are since the probe is in the slab itself, it is not highly sensitive to ambient conditions such as temperature, ambient humidity, etc. This is really easy and fast. You place the probes the day before, the sensors the day before, and come back with the probe and take quick readings. There is very little room for error as these are electronic measurements. Another test that we wanted to cover that, that tests for moisture is the ASTM F1869. This is commonly referred to as the calcium chloride test and one that has been around for quite a while. This is a quantitative test method. Again, you're gonna get a number that measures the moisture vapor emission rate from the top of the slab. The moisture vapor emission rate here is going to be in pounds per thousand square feet per 24 hours. Many people will colloquially refer to it as pounds. This test only reflects the condition of the concrete at the time of the test itself. HVAC systems, ambient humidity, and job site kind of conditions can all affect this test. So this test only reflects the moisture content in the top three quarter inch of the slab. And this is because, as you can see in the picture below, those little calcium chloride pellets are placed on the surface and not into the slab itself. So those little that little dish of calcium chloride pellets is weighed before and after the, to receive the measurement. So the dish is placed and then 60 to 72 hours later, the dish is reweighed to determine the amount of moisture that those pellets have absorbed. And that can be then transferred into that moisture vapor emission rate in pounds. There is a lot of room for error with this test as you could drop a pellet um, if you need, if you don't have a scale on site, these are often shipped off to labs, which can induce air if it is exposed to humidity during the shipping process. And this test takes three days. Again, this does not address the moisture content of the entire thickness of the slab. So just some things to note about these two tests. The calcium chloride test and in situ probe test are not related and no correlation should be drawn. Like we mentioned, the moisture vapor emission rate test, the calcium chloride test, only looks at the top three quarters inch of the slab, while the percent RH looks at the whole slab. For that reason, you're getting two different pictures, so you cannot correlate the two. The moisture vapor emission rate is greatly affected by environmental conditions, such as ambient humidity, since those pellets are directly 
affected and exposed to the ambient conditions. While the Parcent RH test, which is the in-situ probe within the concrete itself, is not greatly affected. We have a warehouse here, and so we figured we'd try these two tests. So out back, our slab is about 20 years old, so first we ran the calcium chloride test. Placed the pellets, waited the 60 to 72 hours, came back, took the mass here in our lab, and we got about six pounds per thousand square feet per 24 hours, which for most installations is relatively low, and we were satisfied. But then we followed up with the in situ probe test, waited the 24 hours, came back with the, the probe, and took our reading. Our reading for that was 94% which for a 20-year-old 20 year slab is quite high, which tells us we likely do not have an intact moisture barrier beneath. For this, we would consider further remediation because the 94% is giving us a full profile of that slab and telling us that we need to be concerned. And the top that day was okay, but the whole slab may not be. So now we told you how to test, but what do you do once you have those test results? So first we wanted to talk about addressing moisture vapor. As Aaron clarified, moisture vapor and liquid water are two very different things when it comes to these installations. So first you want to analyze your slab using the test, me test methods we just talked about, the F2170 or the F1869, to determine if further action is required. Further action may be required based on your product's limitations, whether that's surface preparation, crack isolation, et cetera. Further action may be as simple as waiting for the, the moisture content of the slab to decrease. However, like Erin mentioned, many construction sites don't have the, leg the luxury of just waiting. So moisture mitigation products can be used. You should know your options. On the bottom right, you can see a topical solution being applied. These are often epoxy-based, or now there are water-based formulas that can be placed once the concrete is already down. Prior to the concrete arriving to the job, you also have a few options. Concrete admixtures, and now we are seeing more and more of this next generation concrete, which is self-drying or self-desiccating, that has moisture content as low as 5% RH, 3% or 5 pounds moisture vapor emission rate, um, and as little as 45 days. We also wanted to touch on topical curing agents. While these may be put on right after the concrete is placed to help speed up the curing, these often act as bond breakers and will need to be removed before your final flooring is installed. So while they may save time up front, you're gonna spend more time removing them. Now as Erin talked about, there's also liquid water. With hydrostatic pressure, really your best option is to contact a structural engineer to remediate the issue. Locate any possible external moisture sources. These could be things like sprinklers, damaged pipe, grading towards the house, et cetera, et cetera. This is actually a picture from a job site in Houston. And you can see in that little yellow circle, the sprinkler is right next to the house. And you can't really tell from this picture, but the grading of the, the lawn is also sloped directly towards the house. So these things need to be remediated to prevent further moisture issues within that house and the flooring. So there's really three big takeaways. Know your slab. Is there an intact vapor barrier? How old is the slab? And what's the moisture profile like using either a percent RH or a moisture vapor emission rate? Know your product's limitations. Know what surface preparation products you're going to come in with and know what crack isolation products you're going to use. Just because your mortar doesn't have a limitation listed explicitly doesn't mean that there aren't going to be any moisture related problems. And plan ahead. Either allow the slab to fully cure and dry, or plan enough time to apply moisture mitigation products. With these three things, you should have successful installations, minimizing efflorescence and other moisture concerns. With that, we'd like to open it up to questions. Emily, Aaron, thank you for that. That was uh, certainly uh, a lot of information and expertly uh, uh, provided to all of our attendees. Um, we do have a couple questions and I'll run through those for you real quickly. So our first okay. question, question was, can a crack isolation membrane be installed over a control joint? So with some crack isolation products, that is allowed, but you'd need to follow the manufacturer's instructions and find that on the product data sheet. 
Great. And when concrete cracks at a control joint, does the concrete only move laterally? Not necessarily. Ideally, it, at a control joint, it would, but each crack is going to be a little different. So you really need to know exactly what you're looking at at that joint. Concrete is going to move on its own. Great. All right. How do how does a person know if the concrete is too porous or not porous enough? So there is an ASTM test for that, and I'm pulling up the number right now. There is a test for the porosity, and it's a water droplet test. It's pretty easy. You simply place a few droplets of water on the slab itself and time how long it takes for, for the water to absorb into the concrete. Okay. I'll get back to you if you can send me the email with the exact ASTM test. So, so what would be really nice if you see um, on the screen attendees, Emily's email address and Aaron's email address. If you have any questions you want to get deeper with them, you can definitely send them a question directly. We do have another question here. Um, I'm a landscaper, and being outside, moisture is always present. Could, could you give me any tips? Um, uh, I, I, I think you kind of touched a couple things in regards to sprinkler heads away from the house. Uh, uh, you know, make sure the grading is going from the house down away from the house. Um, anything else for a landscaper? Yeah, those are really the big ones. Um, not, not placing the sprinklers right next to the house is a big one. We were quite surprised to see that picture. Um, and making sure that it, the, the grading is sloped away, um, that flower beds aren't right up against the house where they're going to constantly be watered, that kind of thing. Uh, biggest thing is the grading and, and the water sources. Great. How can concrete, which is in a high-rise building, have moisture in it uh, many years later? You're talking about so, the. You're mainly talking about the base concrete. You're not talking about concrete in each and every floor, are you? Yeah, we focus mainly on on the um, slab on grade, but in in multi-level construction, there's likely a source of the moisture if it's many years later. True. Uh, Good. So in other words, what you're saying is there could be a, a, uh, a leak of some type in the plumbing or something like that, correct? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Where does the moisture go when um, the topical moisture membranes are placed over a large, over a large slab? Did you so hear that? So it's going to have to... Yes, it's going to have to escape through a, a different means. So either out through the sides of the moisture, or it's the the key there is really it's not coming through the top and affecting your tile. Correct. That's the key issue is stopping the moisture from coming through the top end of the tile for sure. All right. How um, how do you moisture test a commercial job, new construction, when most of the time there aren't even windows installed yet? So those ASTM tests that we talked about do, do require that proper, proper service conditions are needed. So the HVAC should be on, the windows should be installed before doing that moisture testing. All right, great. Okay, well, it looks like we've answered all of our attendees' questions. I want to make sure all of our attendees um, please get a chance to jot down Emily and Aaron's email address if you have any other questions. I provided my email address on the chat screen, so hopefully you have that if you're interested in the archive version, or you can send me the questions and I'll get a hold of Emily and Aaron and we'll get them answered. Thanks everybody, appreciate it, and um, look forward to our next webinar, which will be coming up on May 30th, and uh, uh, you'll be getting an invite soon, so thank you again. Appreciate it everybody.